Lower Leg, Ankle, and Foot Conditions, Chapter 19. Conditions of the ankle and lower leg include fractures of the tibia, fibula, and ankle, ankle sprains including inversion, eversion, and high ankle sprains, Achilles tendinopathy and rupture, tarsal tunnel syndrome, medial tibial stress syndrome including stress fractures, periostitis, and posterior anterior tibialis overuse, deep vein thrombosis, and compartment syndrome, which could either be acute or traumatic or chronic and exertional. These three bones, the tibia, fibula, and talus, make up the bony elements of the ankle joint, a fibrous membrane called the joint capsule, which is lined with a smoother layer called the synovium, encases the joint architecture. The joint capsule contains the synovial fluid produced by the synovium. The synovial fluid allows for smooth movement of the joint surfaces. The ankle joint is stabilized by several ligaments, which are fibers that hold these bones into place. When you stress an ankle joint beyond the strength of its elements, you injure the joint. If only the ligaments give way and tear, you have sprained the ankle. If a bone gives way and breaks, you have an ankle fracture. Fractures can occur with simultaneous tears of the ligaments, and you can do this in several ways. By rolling the ankle in or out, twisting the ankle side to side, or flexing or extending the joint. You can also apply severe force to the joint by coming straight down on it as if jumping from a high level. Common signs and symptoms will include sharp, severe pain, immediate swelling, deformity, crepitus. Ambulation may be possible in cases of isolated fibular fracture. Since the fibula does not hold a whole lot of weight bearing, the fibular fracture will allow the patient to still walk around or ambulate. We must check the distal pulse to make sure that blood flow is still flowing to distal structures. Specific types of fractures are a POTS fracture, which is when both the lateral and medial malleoli are fractured. This happens most frequently when an athlete steps in a hole in the ground. A Mason Nouveau fracture is a fibular shaft fracture that is a result of an eversion ankle sprain. During the extreme eversion, the lateral malleoli is driven up into the shaft of the fibula and results in a fracture in the shaft or neck of the fibula. An ankle sprain refers to the tearing of ligaments in the ankle and accounts for approximately 40% of all athletic injuries. 85% of ankle sprains occur on the outside or lateral side of the ankle and are known as inversion ankle sprains. This is a type of injury most athletes experience when they sprain their ankle. Medial ankle sprains, or a sprain to the inside of the ankle, occurs less frequently and is usually associated with fractures or other traumatic events. So why is an inversion sprain so common? You can put it down to our lopsided anatomy. The bone on the lateral side or outside of the ankle, the lateral malleolus or distal fibula, extends further down than the bone on the inside of the ankle or medial malleolus and fibula. This difference gives the inside of the ankle, the medial side, more stability than the outside of the ankle, the lateral side. The ankle is commonly sprained when the foot is plantar flexed and inverted. Signs and symptoms include lateral ankle pain, swelling, echemosis, a popping sensation, and an inability to bear weight or limping. Medial ankle pain may also be present. This is a result of a compression of the deltoid ligament, which can get pinched between the tarsal bones and the medial malleolus. We need to rule out fracture and treat the ankle sprain conservatively. At a symptomatic level, most ankle sprains appear to resolve completely without rehabilitation. In reality, ankle sprains that have not been rehabilitated correctly are usually susceptible to further injury. Rehabilitation is very important to regain function. An eversion ankle sprain is rare and occurs when the ankle rolls too far inwards. It is often accompanied by a fracture of the fibula bone. An eversion ankle sprain is a tear of the deltoid ligaments on the inside of the ankle. It is often called a medial ankle sprain or a deltoid ligament sprain. These ligaments provide support to prevent the ankle from turning inwards or everting. It is rare for the deltoid ligament to be sprained for two reasons. The fibula bone tends to prevent the ankle from moving far enough to sprain or overstretch the ligaments on the inside of the ankle, and it simply does not allow the foot to move far enough to cause damage. Another reason is that the medial ligaments on the inside of the ankle are stronger than the lateral ligaments on the outside of the ankle. For this reason, an eversion ankle sprain is often associated with fracture of the end of the fibular bone called a lateral malleolus, which can be felt on the bony part of the outside of the ankle. The other bones in the ankle, such as the talus, can also be fractured during an eversion ankle sprain. The athlete will usually know that they have sprained their ankle. There will be immediate pain on the inside of the ankle after twisting it. There will be rapid swelling and bruising may develop. 
They will complain of difficulty walking or weight bearing and have limited range of motion. In moderate to severe eversion ankle sprains, it is always recommended that an x-ray is requested to rule out fracture. A high ankle sprain is also known as a syndesmotic sprain. It is a sprain of the syndesmotic ligament that connects the tibia and fibula in the lower leg, thereby creating the mortise for the ankle joint. The talus fits inside a healthy mortise to support the body weight. High ankle sprains are described as high because they are located above the ankle joint. They comprise approximately 15% of all ankle sprains. Unlike a common lateral ankle sprain, when ligaments around the ankle are injured through an inward twisting, high ankle sprains are caused when the lower leg and foot externally rotates or twists out. A high ankle sprain occurs when the foot is placed in external rotation and dorsiflexion. Signs and symptoms of a syndesmosis sprain of the ankle are anterior distal tibia and fibular pain, swelling, but it is usually diffuse and is not as prominent as in lateral ankle sprains, pain with all movements, especially weight-bearing activities. When weight is placed on the lower extremity, the talus pushes up between the mortise, the tibia, and the fibula and causes them to separate. As the tibia and fibula are wedged apart, the syndesmosis continues to tear. You can see an example of this condition in the x-ray picture on the right. Management should include examining the lower extremity for fracture. It is not uncommon to have an eversion sprain with damage to the deltoid ligament at the same time as a syndesmosis sprain. Achilles tendon rupture is when the Achilles tendon breaks. The Achilles is the most commonly injured tendon in the body. Rupture can occur when performing actions requiring explosive acceleration, such as pushing off or jumping. The male to female ratio for Achilles tendon rupture varies between 7 to 1 and 4 to 1 across various studies. The Achilles tendon is most commonly injured by a sudden plantar flexion or dorsiflexion of the ankle, or by forced dorsiflexion of the ankle outside its normal range of motion. Other mechanisms by which the Achilles tendon can be torn involve sudden direct trauma to the tendon or sudden activation of the Achilles after atrophy from prolonged periods of inactivity. Some other common tears can occur from overuse while participating in intense sports. Twisting or jerking motions can also contribute to injury. Fluoroquinone antibiotics, famously ciprofloxacin, are known to increase the risk of tendon rupture, particularly the Achilles tendon. Signs and symptoms of an Achilles tendon rupture include history of tendinopathy, which will result in pain with active plantar flexion. This pain is typically worse in the morning or at the beginning of activity. Other things you might notice when examining someone for Achilles tendon rupture is the history of a tendinopathy exostosis, which is commonly called a pump bump. This is a bony outgrowth on the heel. The Achilles tendon has pulled away from the calcaneus and an exostosis or bony outgrowth has formed. They might also report a squeaky sensation that was heard or felt in the calf before the injury and may have had a previous history of calf tightness. When there is a rupture, there is most often an obvious deformity and the calf will contract with the torn Achilles tendon. Tarsal tunnel syndrome is also known as posterior tibial neuralgia and is a compression neuropathy and painful foot condition in which the tibial nerve is compressed as it travels through the tarsal tunnel. This tunnel is found along the inner side of the leg behind the medial malleolus. The posterior tibial artery, tibial nerve, and tendons of the tibialis posterior flexor digitorum longus and flexor hallucis longus muscles all travel in a bundle through this tarsal tunnel. Patients with tarsal tunnel syndrome typically complain of numbness in the foot that radiates to the big toe and the first three toes, pain, burning, and electrical sensation or tingling over the base of the foot and heel. Ankle pain is present in patients who have high level entrapments. Inflammation or swelling can occur within this tunnel for a number of reasons. The flexor retinaculum has a limited ability to stretch, so an increased pressure will eventually cause compression on the nerve within the tunnel. As pressure increases on the nerves, the blood flow decreases. Nerves respond with altered sensation like tingling and numbness. Fluid collects in the foot when standing and walking and this makes the condition worse. As small muscles lose their nerve supply, they can create a cramping feeling. Other signs and symptoms include pain and tingling in and around the ankles, sometimes in the toes, swelling of the feet, painful burning, tingling, or numbness sensation in the lower leg, pain is typically worse and spreads after standing for long periods of time, 
It can also be worse with activity and is relieved by rest. Electrical shock sensations, pain radiating up into the leg and down into the arch, heel, or toes, hot or cold sensations in the feet, a feeling as though the feet do not have enough padding, pain while operating automobiles, especially if they drive a stick shift, pain along the posterior tibial nerve path, and burning sensations on the bottom of the foot that radiates up towards the knee, pins and needles type feeling with increased sensation on the feet, and a positive Tonell sign. Tonell sign is a tingling electrical shock sensation that occurs when you tap over an affected nerve. The sensation usually travels to the foot, but can also travel to the inner leg as well. Management for tarsal tunnel syndrome includes price and insets. The use of orthotics can help to support the arch and foot taking pressure off of the tarsal tunnel. Injections may be used to help with inflammation, and if all the conservative treatment does not work, a tarsal tunnel release surgery is most likely to be the next option for patients. Shin splints, or medial tibial stress syndrome, is a common exercise-related problem. The term shin splints refers to pain along the inner edge of the shin bone, or tibia. Shin splints or medial tibial stress syndrome is an inflammation of the muscles, tendons, and bone tissue around your tibia. Pain typically occurs on the inner border of the tibia where the muscles attach to the bone. Shin splints typically develop after physical activity. In general, shin splints develop when the muscle in the bone tissue or the periosteum in the leg become overworked by repetitive activity. This condition often occurs after sudden changes in physical activity. These can be changes in frequency, such as increasing the number of days you exercise each week, changes in duration and intensity, such as running longer distances or on hills can also cause shin splints. Possible causes of medial tibial stress syndrome include stress fracture, periostitis, and tibialis posterior and or tibialis anterior overuse. Other factors that have contributed to shin splints include having flat feet or abnormally rigid arches, exercising with improper or worn out footwear. Almost all patients who suffer from medial tibial stress syndrome have a foot alignment or biomechanical issue within their gait. Runners are at the highest risk for developing shin splints. Dancers and military recruits are two other groups that frequently are diagnosed with this condition. Any vigorous sports activity can bring on shin splints, especially if you are just starting a fitness program. The most common sign or symptom of shin splints is pain along the border of the tibia. Mild swelling in the area may also occur. Shin splints may occur as a result of a stress fracture. Shin splints or stress fracture pain may be sharp and razor-like or dull and throbbing, occur both during and after exercise, be aggravated by touching the sore spot. The person may also have crepitus, which is a crunching sound with palpation. If a stress fracture is present, the person may complain of night pain that wakes them up. An x-ray may be negative since stress fractures take a while to show up. Simple measures can relieve the pain of shin splints. Rest, ice, and stretching often help. Taking care to not overdo your exercise routine will help prevent shin splints from coming back. Shin splints can also be caused by periostitis. Periostitis is an inflammation of the bone membrane, better known as the periosteum. Periostitis is caused by repetitive muscle contractions, which end up creating a pulling force on the periosteum, which then leads to inflammation. Signs and symptoms of periostitis-related medial tibial stress syndrome include tenderness over the tibia, crepitus, and abnormal foot or arch alignment. Compressive forces around the shin help decrease the pain if it is associated with periostitis. The tibialis anterior and posterior muscles may contribute to the medial tibial stress syndrome as well. These two muscles are on opposite sides of the calf and any imbalance or overuse of either muscle may result in shin splints. The signs and symptoms associated with tibialis anterior or tibialis posterior related medial tibial stress syndrome include tenderness over the muscle belly or origin point for the muscle, pain increases with active movement, for the tibialis anterior involvement, it will result in pain with inversion and dorsiflexion. For tibialis posterior involvement, it will result in pain with inversion and plantar flexion. Deep vein thrombosis occurs when a blood clot or thrombus forms in one or more of the deep veins in your body, usually your legs. Deep vein thrombosis can cause leg pain or swelling, but it may also occur without any other symptoms. 
Deep vein thrombosis can happen if you do not move for long periods of time, such as after a surgery or following an accident or when you are confined to a hospital or nursing home bed. Deep vein thrombosis are often asymptomatic at first and may not have any symptoms appear at all. A dull, achy pain in one leg can start the appearance of symptoms. The pain often starts in your calf and can feel like a cramping or a soreness. This will increase to an intense, throbbing pain. Fatigue and cramping of the muscles is common. Warm skin, swelling, and redness, and tightness of the calf muscle are also common signs and symptoms. The swelling is in the affected leg, and rarely there may be swelling in both legs. Deep vein thrombosis is a serious condition because blood clots in your veins can break loose. They can then travel to your bloodstream and lodge in your lungs, heart, or brain, blocking blood flow. A blood clot that close to your lungs could result in a pulmonary embolism. A clot that goes to your heart could result in a heart attack or a myocardial infarction, and a clot that goes to the brain could result in a stroke. Therefore, immediate referral is the recommended management for a person suspected of having a deep vein thrombosis. The lower leg is divided into four compartments, the anterior compartment, the lateral compartment, the deep posterior compartment, and the superficial posterior compartment. Each compartment contains connective tissue, nerves, and blood vessels. Fascia, which is made up of a strong type of connective tissue, surrounds each compartment in the lower leg. The fascia also separates the skeletal muscle from the subcutaneous tissue. Due to the great pressure placed on the leg from the column of blood from the heart to the feet, the fascia is very thick in order to support the leg muscles. The thickness of the fascia can give problems when any inflammation is present in the leg as it has very little room to expand. Blood vessels and nerves can also be affected by the pressure, causing more swelling in the leg. If the pressure becomes great enough, blood flow to the muscles can be blocked, leading to a condition that is known as compartment syndrome. Severe damage to the nerve and blood vessels around the muscles can cause the muscles to die and amputation may be necessary. Compartment syndrome is a painful condition that occurs when pressure within the muscles builds to a dangerous level. This pressure can decrease blood flow, which prevents nourishment and oxygen from reaching nerve and muscle cells. Compartment syndrome can either be acute or chronic. Acute compartment syndrome is a medical emergency. It is usually caused by a severe injury. Without treatment, it can lead to permanent muscle damage or amputation. Chronic compartment syndrome, also known as exertional compartment syndrome, is usually not a medical emergency. It is most often caused by athletic exertion. Compartment syndrome develops when swelling or bleeding occurs within a compartment. Because the fascia does not stretch, this can cause an increased pressure in the capillaries, nerves, and muscles of the compartment. Blood flow to the muscle and nerve cells are disrupted. Without a steady supply of oxygen and nutrients, nerve and muscle cells can be damaged. In acute compartment syndrome, unless the pressure is relieved quickly, permanent disability and tissue death may result. This does not usually happen in chronic or exertional compartment syndrome. Compartment syndrome most often occurs in the anterior or front compartment of the lower leg. Acute compartment syndrome usually develops after a severe injury such as a car accident or a broken bone. Rarely it develops after a relatively minor injury. Conditions that may bring on an acute compartment syndrome include a fracture. A badly bruised muscle, this type of injury can occur when a motorcycle falls on the leg of a rider or a football player gets hit in the leg with another player's helmet. Reestablished blood flow after blocked circulation, this may occur after a surgeon repairs a damaged blood vessel that has been blocked for several hours. A blood vessel can be blocked during sleep. Lying for too long in a position that blocks a blood vessel and then moving or waking up can cause this condition. Most healthy people will naturally move when blood flow to a limb is blocked during sleep. The development of compartment syndrome in this manner usually occurs in people who are neurologically compromised. This can happen after severe intoxication with alcohol or other drugs. Crush injuries and anabolic steroid use. Taking steroids is a possible factor in compartment syndrome. The last one is constrictive bandages. Casts and tight bandages may lead to compartment syndrome. If symptoms of compartment syndrome develop, remove or loosen any constricting bandages. If you have a cast, contact your doctor immediately. Signs and symptoms of traumatic or acute compartment syndrome include severe pain, swelling out of proportion, tight or shiny skin, numbness and tingling, and a diminished distal pulse. 
you should check the patient's distal pulse and activate EMS immediately as this is a medical emergency. Exertional compartment syndrome or chronic compartment syndrome is usually caused by exercise. Athletes who participate in activities with repetitive motions such as running, biking, or swimming are more likely to develop chronic compartment syndrome. This is usually relieved by discontinuing the exercise and is not usually dangerous. Some theories regarding the cause of exertional compartment syndrome include the chronic inflammation and buildup of metabolic waste, like lactic acid, associated with frequent exercise. Others have contributed the cause to more excessive fluid pressure that increases with exercise. Signs and symptoms of exertional compartment syndrome include tight cramping-like or squeezing ache, a sensation of fullness, weakness or inability to contract the muscle, Symptoms will usually subside or completely go away with rest, and neurological involvement is rare. The physical examination of acute and chronic compartment syndrome is necessary to determine the cause and treatment. For acute compartment syndrome, go to an emergency room immediately if there is a concern about acute compartment syndrome. This is a medical emergency. Your doctor will measure the compartment pressure to determine whether you have acute compartment syndrome. To diagnose chronic compartment syndrome, your doctor must rule out other conditions that could also cause pain in the lower leg. For example, your doctor may press on your tendons to make sure you do not have tendonitis. He or she may order an x-ray to make sure that your shin bone or your tibia does not have a stress fracture. To confirm chronic compartment syndrome, your doctor will measure the pressure in your compartment before and after exercise. If pressure remains high after exercise, you have chronic compartment syndrome. To treat acute compartment syndrome, emergency surgery is required. There is no effective non-surgical treatment. A doctor will make an incision and cut open the skin and fascia covering the affected compartment. This procedure is called a fasciotomy. Sometimes the swelling can be severe enough that the skin incision cannot be closed immediately. The incision is surgically repaired when swelling subsides. Sometimes the skin graft is also used. Exertional compartment syndrome can be treated conservatively with physical therapy, orthotics, and anti-inflammatory medicines. If that does not work, surgical intervention may be necessary. The foot conditions to be discussed within this lecture include metatarsal fractures, including Jones, avulsion, and stress fracture, toe deformities, which include claw, hammer, and mallet toe, as well as hallux valgus, bunions and bunionettes, plantar fasciitis, and turf toe. The metatarsal bones are long bones in your foot that connect your ankle to your toes. They also help you balance when you stand or walk. A sudden blow or twist of your foot or overuse can cause a break or acute sudden fracture in one of the bones. There are five metatarsal bones in your foot. The fifth metatarsal is the outer bone that connects to your little toe. It is the most commonly fractured metatarsal bone. A break in the part of your fifth metatarsal closest to the ankle is called a Jones fracture. This area of the bone has low blood flow. This makes healing difficult. An avulsion fracture occurs when the tendon pulls a piece of the bone away from the rest of the bone. An avulsion fracture on the fifth metatarsal is called a dancer's fracture. Signs and symptoms commonly include pain, swelling, and crepitus over the area. There's a possible problem with healing as some of the area is avascular and may not heal correctly. Two of the most common types of metatarsal fractures include an avulsion fracture and a Jones fracture. An avulsion fracture happens when the tendon from the peroneus brevis rips off a portion of the base of the fifth metatarsal. Sometimes this is referred to as the styloid process. The patient is placed in a walking boot for immobilization and protection. This injury tends to heal well. In a Jones fracture, the bone fractures at the neck of the fifth metatarsal. This area of the bone is not well vascularized and has a high non-union rate. The patient is placed in a walking boot after surgical fixation of the bone is performed. There are three main forms of toe abnormalities in the human foot, claw toes, hammer toes, and mallet toes. A claw toe involves the abnormal position of all three joints in the toe. It consists of an extension contracture with dorsal subluxation of the metatarsal phalangeal joint together with flexion deformities of the proximal interphalangeal, or PIP, and the distal interphalangeal joint, which is also known as the DIP. A hammer toe shows extension of the metatarsal phalangeal joint and of the distal interphalangeal joint. The proximal interphalangeal joint is hyperflexed. A mallet toe shows a flexion of the DIP, or distal interphalangeal joint, which is most common in the second toe. 
They occur throughout life, although most are seen in the seventh or eighth decade of life. Women are affected four to five times more often than men. Toe deformities are caused by a variety of factors. They can be associated with pes cavus, which is a deformity resulting from an underlying neurological condition. They may be genetic, or they could be from poorly fitted shoes, usually the result of wearing shoes that are too short. Many people have second toes that are longer than their big toe. If they wear shoes that are sized to fit the big toe, the second toe has to bend to fit the shoe, causing a mallet toe. High-heeled shoes with pointed toes are also a major cause of claw toes. Bunions, highly arched feet, rheumatoid arthritis, and tendon imbalance, which can occur when the foot cannot function normally. The tendons may stretch or tighten to compensate, leading to toe deformities. This can also be a result of traumatic injuries to the toe. A bunion, which is also referred to as hallux valgus, is often described as a bump on the side of the big toe. But a bunion is more than that. A visible bump is actually a reflected change in the bony framework of the front part of the foot. The big toe leans towards the second toe rather than pointing straight ahead. This throws the bones out of alignment, producing the bunion's bump. Bunions are a progressive disorder. They begin with the leaning of the big toe, gradually changing the angle of the bones over the years and slowly producing the characteristic bump, which becomes increasingly prominent. Symptoms usually appear at later stages, although some people never have symptoms. Bunions are most often caused by inherited faulty mechanical structures of the foot. It is not the bunion itself that is inherited, but certain foot types that make a person prone to developing a bunion. Wearing shoes that crowd the toes won't actually cause bunions, but sometimes it makes the deformity get progressively worse. Symptoms may therefore appear sooner. Bunions are a deviation to the first metatarsal phalangeal joint. A tailor's bunion, also called a bunionette, is a prominence of the fifth metatarsal bone at the base of the little toe. The metatarsals are the five long bones in the foot. The prominence that characterizes a tailor's bunion occurs at the metatarsal head, which is located at the far end of the bone where the bone meets the toe. A tailor's bunion or a bunionette is not as common as a regular bunion, which occurs on the inside of the foot, but they are similar in symptoms and cause. Why is it called a tailor's bunion? The deformity received its name centuries ago when tailors sat cross-legged all day with the outside of their edge on the feet rubbing the ground. This constant rubbing led to a painful bump at the base of the little toe. Both bunions and bunionettes are caused by an exostosis or a bony outgrowth, bursitis, and a callus formation. Symptoms which occur at the site of a bunion or bunionette may include pain or soreness, inflammation and redness, a burning sensation, and possible numbness. Symptoms occur most often when wearing shoes that crowd the toes, such as shoes with a tight toe box or high heels. This may explain why women are more likely to have symptoms than men. In addition, spending long periods of time on your feet can aggravate the symptoms of bunions. Plantar fasciitis is one of the most common causes of heel pain. It involves pain and inflammation of the thick band of tissue called the plantar fascia, that runs along the bottom of your foot and connects your heel bone to your toes. Plantar fasciitis commonly causes stabbing pain that usually occurs with your very first step in the morning. Once your foot limbers up, the pain of plantar fasciitis normally decreases, but it may return after long periods of standing or after getting up from a seated position. Plantar fasciitis is particularly common in runners. In addition, people who are overweight and those who wear shoes with inadequate support are at risk for plantar fasciitis. Plantar fasciitis typically causes a stabbing pain in the bottom of your foot near the heel. The pain is usually worse with the first few steps after awakening. Management for plantar fasciitis should include price and steroid injections, arch support, Achilles tendon stretching, massage, and night splinting and dorsiflexion. This is a slide demonstrating some plantar fasciitis stretching exercises in the picture on the left, including calf stretching, sitting plantar fascia stretch, Achilles stretch, and frozen can rolls. Rolling a tennis ball under the foot can also be helpful to stretch the plantar fascia. Arch supports may assist during daily activities. And the top right picture is an example of a night brace which holds the foot into a dorsiflex position which keeps the plantar fascia in a lengthened position at night and can help alleviate early morning pain associated with plantar fasciitis. Turf toe is not a term you want to use when talking to a head football coach about his star running back or the ballerina right before her diva debut. 
Turf toe is a common term that's used to describe a sprain of the ligaments around the big toe joint, although it is commonly associated with football players who play on artificial turf. It affects athletes in other sports, including soccer, basketball, wrestling, gymnastics, and dance. It is a condition that is caused by jamming the big toe or repeatedly pushing off the big toe forcefully, as in running or jumping. Turf toe is a sprain to the ligaments around the big toe. It works primarily as a hinge to permit up and down motion. Just behind the big toe joint is the ball of your foot where two P-shaped bones are embedded in the tendon that moves your big toe, called sesamoid bones. These bones work like a pulley for the tendon and provide leverage when you walk or run. They also absorb the weight that presses on the ball of your foot. When you are walking or running, you start each subsequent step by raising your heel and letting your body weight come forward onto the ball of your foot. At a certain point, you propel yourself forward by pushing off your big toe and allowing your weight to shift to the other foot. If the toe for some reason stays flat on the ground or does not lift to push off, you run the risk of suddenly entering the area around the joint. Or if you are tackled or fall forward and the toe stays flat, the effect is the same as if you were sitting or bending your big toe back by hand beyond its normal limit, causing hyperextension of the toe. That hyperextension repeated over time or with enough force can cause a sprain in the ligaments that surround the joint. Typically with turf toe, the injury is sudden. It is most commonly seen in athletes playing on artificial surfaces. These harder surfaces are more likely to make cleats stick. It can also happen on grass surfaces, especially if the shoe being worn does not provide adequate support for the foot. Often the injury occurs in athletes wearing flexible soccer style shoes that let the foot bend too far forward. The most common symptom of turf toe includes pain, swelling, and limited motion at the base of the big toe. The symptoms develop slowly and gradually get worse over time if it is caused by repetitive injury. If it is caused by a sudden forceful motion, the injury can be painful immediately and worsen within 24 hours. Sometimes when the injury occurs, a pop can be felt. Usually the entire joint is involved and toe movement is limited. Management is usually taping the area to prevent further movement. Sometimes hard insoles can be placed in the shoe that will help reduce motion and help protect the toe.